but it's, it, but I think that there's uh, literature and almost everything else derives from the shape and function of the brain. And I think large other parts of culture all around the world are determined by the way the brain is put together. Uh, as you can see from the little introductory note there at the top, Roger Sperry won the 1981 Nobel Prize in Literature for his theory on the bi-hemispheric nature of the brain. The brain has two hemispheres, two different sides. They're connected by a bridge of tissue called the corpus callosum. Originally, everybody thought that the brain was all one piece and it had functioned pretty much the same. Even though through the 19th century, the uh, anatomist had found that there are different parts of the brain that are assigned to, diff to different movements, the movements of different limbs, for example, there's a real large part of the brain that controls your tongue and a, an even larger part that controls your thumb and so on, but nobody really realized until Sperry started doing, doing his experiments that there were very probably two completely different, almost two completely different personalities inside of you. Two different people live inside your head. They think in entirely different ways. That's <clears throat> the uh, way they process information is, of course, what makes the difference between them. Now, Sperry had some, he was a doctor, and he had some epilep uh, epileptic patients. They were having seizures that were traveling across from one side of the brain to the other, and which were life-threatening. And he thought that maybe if he cut the corpus callosum, he'd be able to stop the spread of the uh, uh, epileptic seizures in short circuits. And, of course, he cut the corpus callosum, and the seizures did cease. However, he found out that some peculiar things had happened to the patients that he performed these operations on. For example, he carried out an experiment with them in which he got a tray of objects, keys, a comb, a ball, he had some jacks, some, whatever he happened to find around, he put them on the tray and he put a screen in front of the patient. And he had the patient reach through the screen and pick up an object. When the patient picked up the object with his right hand, he could name the object. This is a comb. But when he put the object back on the tray and was asked to find the same object again, he couldn't do it. However, if he put his left hand through the screen and picked up an object and then put it back on the tray, he could find the object again with no trouble. But he couldn't name the object, whatever it was. So what the left brain knew the right brain didn't know. Now, I should point out uh, initially that the two hemispheres of the brain, because the nerve uh, pathways, as they enter the skull, cross over here where they go through the foramen magnum, the left side of the brain controls the right side of the body, and the right side of the brain controls the left side of the body. You'll see me doing that a lot, touching each side. I'm slightly dyslexic, so I have trouble with left and right, so in order to keep them straight, I have to go, wait a minute now, this is the left. In any case, they cross over. And what one half of the brain knew, once that corpus callosum, that bridge between the two was cut, the other side of the brain didn't know. This led Sperry to carry out <coughs> a number of other <coughs> experiments with his patients, and gradually he found out that these two sides of the brain process information in completely different ways. Um, some of his patients actually seemed to have two different personalities living inside him. For example, he had one patient who uh, he had had a mild stroke, and he had some trouble after the operation tying his uh, tying the belt for his bathrobe. And he would tie the thing primarily with his right hand, and as soon as it was tied, his left hand would take it and untie it. And when his wife came and tried to help him with it, the right hand was perfectly happy to let her do the tying. The left hand would slap at her hand and push her away like it didn't want her interfering with it. Now, gradually, over a long period of time, the two halves of the brain eventually seemed to come to some kind of a compromise, and the, the guy was able to live a moderately normal life. All of us have, of course, both hemispheres, and they both work together. But they struggle, they seem to struggle for dominance across that corpus callosum, one being pretty much in control of it one time, and another being in control of it at a different time. If you're really efficient in the way you think and operate in the world, the chances are that you probably shift hemispheres depending on the task that you're involved in. There are also, by the way, some sex differences in the hemisphere, in lateralization, in which hemisphere dominates. Men tend to have a dominant left hemisphere. Women tend to have a more balanced set of hemispheres. That, of course, allows them to be more adaptable. 
uh, that may have uh, evolutionary significance, biological significance. Apart from, now granted, <coughs> all women are not the same, all men are not the same, you will find men who fit the normal uh, characteristics of women and vice versa. But generally, if you look at it from an evolutionary standpoint, it makes sense to have for women to have the best equipment, <coughs> which they tend to do all over. Women have uh, an extra layer of fat which makes them uh, less prone to starve to death, less prone to freeze to death. Um, they're able to coordinate things better. Small muscle coordination is much better than it is in men. A number of areas in which they have better physiology. Well, it would also make sense to give them a more adaptable brain since they are the ones who have to survive. If you have one man and 20 women, the species will go on. If you have 20 men and one woman, you can't replace fast enough. The species will die out. You just can't go on to another generation. So as far as the species is concerned, women are much more valuable. They have the children. They perpetuate the species. Therefore, adaptation is more important to, to them. The strong lateralization for men, which you'll see tends to lead to a very step-by-step, -step, rigorous, uh, less adaptable type of thinking um, also has some biological adaptability. In other words, the basic function of men is to perish in defense of the next generation. That's primarily what we're, we're made for. That's why we have the upper body strength. That's the one thing that, that uh, males tend to have that females don't as an advantage is upper body strength. Otherwise, almost all the physiology lands on the side of, of women. Uh, this lateralization of the brain and the tendency for men to have the left hemisphere develop would, well, we have to get a little bit into uh, how the hemispheres work, but you'll see this is the emotional side. And from the point of being a, a protector and defending the species, you don't want uh, a lot of emotion involved in that. In other words, saber-toothed, you can see this going back millions of years. The saber-toothed tiger comes to the cave. Um, if, the, if the male who's guarding the cave reacts primarily in terms of the left, right hemisphere of the brain and acts on the emotional side, he's going to run away. So we want that emotion suppressed so he can stand there and get himself eaten while woman and child manage to get further back in the cave or the saber-toothed tiger gets full and says, well, I'll come back for them later. They'll be, they'll be dessert or whatever. So there seems to be a, a biological advantage to that, to the way the brain has developed. Uh, one of the main differences between the two sides of the brain is the way that they think. In other words, the left hemisphere of the brain, which again is dominated by the right hand, which tends to dominate our culture, is verbal. In most people, the speech centers are, on, are in the left hemisphere of the brain. So this hemisphere of the brain then tends to think in words. In about 15% of the population, there are speech centers on in the right hemisphere of the brain. In a very small percentage of people, there are speech centers in both sides of the brain. I have the feeling myself that probably poets in particular, maybe most writers, are people who have speech centers in both sides of the brain. That would give them an enormous drive to express themselves because instead of just having one side of the brain that wants to talk all the time, you've got two sides of the brain that want to do the talking. And so naturally, they uh, would be <clears throat> there'd be a tendency to get those always want to get those words out. How many of you have um, how many of you have a voice in your head when you think? Well, that's most a lot of people. Well, I ain't gonna tell them. That. <laughs> well, they got crazy. You hear voices in your head. That would probably tend to mean that you have a tendency to be dominated by the uh, left hemisphere of the brain, where the speech centers are. If you don't hear a voice, if you think in pictures, then you're more likely to be to have a dominant right hemisphere of the brain. And again, no matter which side dominates, you still use both sides. It's just really a matter of emphasis. While the left hemisphere of the brain thinks in words, the right hemisphere thinks iconically. It thinks in icons or symbolic pictures. That, of course, allows it to organize a lot more information than can the speech side of the brain. You know, the old uh, cliche that a, that a picture is worth a thousand words. A picture, in fact, is worth a lot more than a thousand words. You can pack enormous amounts of information into pictures. 
that you can't pack into speech because speech has to go all the way out in a line and it takes so many words to cover what's obviously there in all detail. So the right hemisphere of the brain then, which thinks in pictures, has an entirely different view of the world. It may also be, by the way, that the uh, right hemisphere of the brain is in more direct contact with the limbic system, which is another substructure in the brain, which sends out all the chemicals to the body, all the hormones and things. There is, in fact, a tendency among some scientists to think that we may not really be in charge of anything that we do. In other words, that all human behavior can be broken down to the biochemistry of the brain, what chemicals your brain happens to be putting out. There's also a thing called, before anything can come to your attention, by the way, there's a thing called the, I think it's called the P30 or the P300 wave. And it's a little blip which signals attention has been got. Generally, uh, information will flow mostly from the right side of the brain across the corpus callosum to the left. And then it's processed there, and they make a compromise back and forth. Well, this is the side that gets stimulated. And the way that it gets stimulated is that the limbic system gives, them a, gives it a shot of the enkephalins. And the enkephalins, or the endorphins, are the natural body opiates. Um, you, every drug that people take for recreation, the body produces itself. The reason we know this is about uh, 1974 or 5. The National Institute of Health was doing work on junkies. They wanted to find out why junkies stayed junkies, why it was so hard to get them to not be junkies anymore. What they found out was that morphine and heroin had attached to receptor sites in the brain in a lock and key arrangement. In other words, the shape of the molecule for, for heroin and morphine fit right into these receptors that were shaped for them. Now that's a real paradox. Why would a four million year old brain have receptors in it for a drug that hadn't been invented probably no more than about 10,000 years ago. The conclusion that they came to was that the body manufactures an analog to morphine. It has a natural uh, morphine that it produces. That's why those structures are there. And since then, they found a whole number of these kinds of morphine. The there's a natural, uh, what's the, the most abused drug? Valium. There's a natural Valium. Um, there are there's a natural uh, speed. There's, in fact, a natural LSD, which we'll, we'll get to in a second. The body produces all of these, and when it wants to get the attention of the right hemisphere, it shoots a little bit of that natural morphine into the right hemisphere to get it to go, oh, yes, all right, I'll pay attention to that now. And then we begin processing the information. Now, changes in the brain, or changes in the way we think, which everybody assumes is under our control, may really be under the control of the cycles of chemistry in the brain, the kind of chemicals the body is producing. How you feel or how you react to a situation may again depend entirely on what chemicals are being produced. For example, if you give somebody a shot of adrenaline, they get very active and their thoughts tend to be very active. And if you put them in a situation which is moderately threatening and which they wouldn't react to too much, if you give them the adrenaline, they react very strongly and get very paranoid about the situation. So that a lot of what we normally assume is completely under our conscious control may not be under our control at all. We may not have that much control of what goes on in our brain. In fact, actually, there's another um, far less popular theory which is just coming out now. There are little pieces of RNA, ribonucleic acid, which is the, which is the chemical that the brain sends messages to the cells with, and it's sort of like the programming for them. And there are bits of those that are just floating around everywhere. It may be that our ideas are nothing more than little pieces of RNA, like little viruses, that get into the brain and make changes in the chemicals which then cause us to react in a particular way. In other words, our emotions may not be under our control. Rationalists tend to think that uh, we're in charge of our brains. Actually, that may not be true. A good portion of the time we spend daydreaming. Our brain isn't going in a single specific direction that we've outlined and that we want it to go in. Um, in fact, it's pretty hard to keep your mind on a single object. For example, if you close your eyes for a second, close your eyes and try to visualize an apple. See an apple in your mind's eye and don't open your eyes again until you don't see the apple anymore 
or until your thoughts wander to something else or until you pat yourself on the back and go, boy, I'm really doing great at this. Most people didn't go 10 seconds. Most people didn't go five, and yet all of us think that we're completely in charge of our brains. And here we can't even control them for 15 seconds. I'll give you another test of how much of a control of your brain you are. Do not think of a pink elephant. <laughs> <laughs> and we're in charge of our brains, and yet you can't not think of one. <clears throat> now this idea, whether or not we're in charge of our brains, and how much our brains have to do with what goes on in the outside of the world, is the basis for just about everything we do and everything we think. Therefore, it's also the basis for literature. And as we go through the course, I'll at times be referring back to this right and left, left hemisphere thing when we are talking about the specific kinds of, of literary movements that have shaped literature all over the world. You notice down in number three, uh, the speech centers, of course, occur in the left hemisphere. The right hemisphere tends to have music centers tends to be able to appreciate rhythm and, and patterns. That's, of course, because the right hemisphere, if you look down at number five, is very good at, primarily tends to function in terms of pattern recognition. Uh, before I can explain that, I guess I really ought to explain the uh, difference between the, the functions in number four, categorizing or sequential logic. Now, the, the right hand of brain, that is the left hemisphere, tends to categorize information. In other words, when information comes in to the left hemisphere of the brain, the first thing that it tries to do is to break it down into smaller amounts and assign those smaller amounts to a series of fixed categories which have already been established. It tends to operate on what's called sequential logic. When we get down a little bit further to Aristotle, he's the one who's most commonly associated with the idea of sequential logic. And in fact, when you use the word logic, most people think of sequential logic. Sequential logic uh, has a kind of formal structure to it. For example, there are three typical styles to a sequentially logical argument, or a lo an argument in what's called, usually called Aristotelian logic. And they usually work this way. Um, the classic example is usually, all men are mortal, Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal. That's the categorical state. Um, there are also two other forms, either A or B, not B, therefore A. A third form for sequential Aristotelian logic is if A, then B. A, therefore B. And A always follows B. Um, now, our society, particularly because since science has become pretty much of a religion um, for us, we tend to accept the idea that sequential logic is pretty much infallible that it's the real way to think, that it's the only kind of thinking that has any um, real value to it. In fact, sequential logic is easily demolished. Anytime you get in an argument with somebody who uses sequential logic, you can blow them away if you can get them to make two categorical statements. That's that first thing, all men are more. That whole sequence of, of reasoning, that those three steps, all depend on that very first statement being true. And it also depends on the statement being all-inclusive. In other words, it has to be a statement that covers every situation. All you have to do then to demolish somebody's argument is to find one instance where that all-inclusive statement isn't true. The easiest way to do that is to get them to make a second generalization. Anytime you get somebody to make two generalizations, if you think hard enough, you'll be able to wreck their argument because you'll be able to find a hypothetical situation where the two generalizations come into conflict. And that's all you need to do, of course, to wreck the argument. For example, let's say somebody said that uh, it's absolutely wrong to kill people. No excuse for killing anybody. Now, that's a categorical statement. You never, you should never kill anybody. All you have to do then is to try to get them to define what they mean by killing somebody and get them to make another all-encompassing generalization. For example, you might say to them, well, that sounds fairly reasonable, but if, what do you mean by kill? For example, if a guy is hanging by his fingers from a cliff and he can't get up, and the only way that he can get up is if I go and help him, and I don't go and help him, did I kill him? They say, yeah. 
You can't do that. You have to help the guy off the cliff. Okay? I got them now. As soon as they've said that, they're finished. All I need now is a hypothetical situation where I have to kill to avoid saving, to, to be able to save somebody else. So all I'd have to say is, guy's hanging from the cliff by his fingers. There's a six foot eight homicidal maniac jumping up and down on his fingers. And he's so big, and he can't be reasoned with. The only way I can keep him from, from making that guy fall off the cliff uh, into the valley is to push him off. Do I do it or not? Double bind. If I pushed him off, I've broken. You can't kill anybody. If I don't push him off, he steps in the guy's fingers and the guy falls, and I've killed him because I haven't saved him. See, so anytime you can get somebody to make two generalizations like that, it's easy to, it's easy to destroy the argument. Same with either, or, either A or B. If somebody says to you, oh, it's either A or it's B, how can you destroy that argument? Find C. All you have to do is find a third alternative. The argument only works if there's two. If you can find a third, then the argument will fall apart. Same thing as if, then. If this happens, that happens. All you have to do is find one time when the first thing happens and the second thing doesn't follow. If that occurs, the whole chain of logic falls apart. And almost all of Aristotelian logic, in order to be absolutely true, has to deal with these categorical statements. So in other words, we overvalue sequential logic. We overvalue and have a much heavier emphasis on the right hand, the right-handed brain, the left hemisphere of the brain, which tends to dominate our way of thinking. Now, the other side of the brain, when you give it information, it tends to take the information and put it into a larger structure. Remember, the other side took information, immediately began to break it down, put it into categories. Uh, the right hemisphere of the brain, on the other hand, tends to take it and put it into a bigger picture of things. It doesn't go for smaller and smaller detail. It tends to function on what's called associational logic. Associational logic occurs all the time. You've probably gotten into one of those situations where uh, you start out talking about the weather, and a couple of minutes later you're talking about cream donuts. And you go, how did we get to be talking about cream donuts? When you trace it back, you find out that somebody said, it's a really nice day out today, there's not a cloud in the sky, and the other person says, well, no, I kind of like it when there are clouds. You know, the kind of white fleecy clouds, sort of like the cream that's in cream donuts, and somebody says, oh, yeah, I like cream donuts. And then you notice how in a chain there, when you, work, when you follow the chain through, it's a logical sequence. But if you told, when you, if you told somebody when you start out talking about the weather and end up on cream donuts, they think you were crazy. But those things are connected by a series of associations. Now, associational logic doesn't, if you measure it by the sequential logic, associational logic isn't real sensible. But it's its own form of logic, and it's equally valid. It's an equally valid way of putting things together. It may be that even in language, although the words are all probably stored over here in the left hemisphere, the pattern that they're put together in may be stored over here in the right hemisphere. It's another pulse. In other words, if you've ever had to, oh, say, call somebody up to complain, or if you had to, say, go to your boss and ask for a raise, and you write down exactly what you want to say, never works. Most of us really don't know what words are going to come out of our mouth next. We know roughly what ideas we want to come out, but the actual sequence of words really doesn't seem to be controlled by this side. That would, of course, make sense because this side of the brain is much better at finding holistic patterns, of looking for uh, recognizing patterns in large amounts of data. You can see under number uh, five there that the left hemisphere looks for detail. If you give it something it tries to find gradations in it. Again, breaking it down into smaller and smaller uh, pieces of information. Pattern recognition, on the, other side, on the other hand, is looking at things and being able to notice how the flow of the information runs. Uh, to give you an example, actually, there are probably, there used to be, a guy named Marshall McLuhan said once that there were two kinds of people. There were print-oriented people and there were media-oriented people. Now, he was saying this in 1969, and 1969 was an enormous during the hippie revolution, there was an enormous generation gap. Um, now, there had always been a generation gap. Even back among the Greeks, I think it was Plato who wrote about how the, the young had no um, 
All he wanted to do was uh, ride chariots through the streets and get drunk and fall off the chariots and stuff. While the older generation wanted to build the Parthenon and make great buildings and think great thoughts and so on, and the two could never seem to get together. But the generation gap seemed to be even more noticeable in the late 60s. And what McLuhan said was that that was primarily because of the way people had been raised. In other words, how they were trained to get their information. If you were born since 1950, the chances are that you're a pattern recognition person. Reason for that is primarily this. If you're born before that, you'll tend to probably be a sequential, uh, sequential logic categorizing person. If you're raised in print, you, most of the information that you get comes in you through print. Print has a couple advantages. For one thing, it sits still. It's always there. You can go back to the paragraph before or the page before, and it's always there. Now that means if your information sits still, it's a lot easier to pay attention to individual details and to see how individual detail is important. So people who are trained on print, print is also linear. In other words, all of our sentences go this way, this way, this way. So they follow in a line. When you read, you read in a line. Um, the ideas tend to come in a line. That conditions you to have ideas which are step by step by step which follow one another in a sequential pattern. However, if most of your information, especially as you're young, is given to you through, say, television, you won't develop as much sequential linear thinking because television doesn't sit still. It does a couple things beside that. First of all, it doesn't print talks to your eyes, but TV talks to your eyes and your ears. You've got two sets of information coming in that has to be processed simultaneously. Not only that, the TV doesn't sit still. It's not there. You can't go back, unless you have a videotape recorder, um, and see what the detail was that you missed. If somebody says something, you don't quite catch it on TV, it's gone. Even people with VCRs don't usually back it up to see what it was the guy said. They normally watch and pick out the overall set of ideas that were presented during that period of time. That would tend to make you a pattern recognition person. In other words, because the information doesn't sit still, you've got to notice the general trend of the information. You may not know most of the details, but you will get the general idea. Print people tend to be detail people. They're not really comfortable unless they know the details of everything. Now, uh, the generation since computers came up, since video games came up, are going to be even more pattern recognition than the current generation. People here are 18 and 19. Kids that are uh, eight and nine years old now, or the ones who are just, you know, are in kindergarten, four and five and stuff, are getting computers or playing video games from then on, are going to even be more oriented towards pattern recognition. I mean, I can see this all the time. When I go and play video games, the 12-year-olds all stand around and laugh. I mean, first of all, it's an old man playing video games to begin with, which doesn't go with the, go with the stereotype anyhow. But secondly, it's the way I play, and I never get really high scores. The reason I never get really high scores is because I was raised on print. I'm primarily linear oriented. I play a game called, uh, that I like the best, a game called Tempest. And it's a grid that comes out from the center. There are these lines. And these little things come out and move up the line, and you have to shoot them. I love games that explode and have a lot of sound in them. Um, you have to shoot these things. And if they get to the top line, they come across and jump on you, and you lose. And you die, and if you lose three times, that's it. Well, I watch the things up because I'm linear. I look at one of those grids, one of those little alleyways at a time, and I shoot the thing that's coming here, and then I look around. Oh, there's another one, and I swing over here, and I shoot that one, and then I swing around, and I shoot another one. But, the, but kids who are brought up on video games and who score much higher don't have to go step by step. They're pattern recognition people. They look into the center of that grid where these little dots that eventually come out and move up the little line and they know from watching those where they're going to come out next. So when they're shooting a thing here, they're already moving over to there. And uh, they're planning to pick this one up at the end of their sweep and then to swing backwards and catch the ones that are coming up. Now you can't do that unless you can recognize immediately the pattern that's going to form next. In order to play video games well, you have to be able to recognize the patterns. It takes me $40 worth of quarters to figure out the first board of the game, because the boards change and you go on to the new boards. It takes them about three or four dollars, because they have an increased pattern recognition. It may also be, though, that that generation might be a new balance generation. 
depending on where they play their video games. If they only play them in the arcades, then they'll tend to be increasingly pattern recognition people, people who deal with strategies, with overall flows of uh, information. If they play their video games on their home computer and also do computing, then they'll be tending to use both hemispheres. Because when you write a program, first of all, you have to recognize with this side of the brain overall where you want the information to go. And then you have to use this side of the brain to write out the step-by-step-by-step-by-step -step 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 program. <coughs> and so we may have a new generation which is uh, capable of using both sides of the brain better than any of the previous generations. Of course, we may just end up with a generation that loves to play video games and nobody will ever work. They'll just take drugs and play video games all their lives. And the, the people who are practical and right-brained will continue keeping the trains running on time and making the video games that everybody's going to play. The left hemisphere, if you look down at number six, is also good in terms of number. Left hemisphere people tend to be better in math. Uh, men tend to be better in math overall. One of the more recent studies where they took all the people who scored over 500 on the math, and there were something like six or seven times as many men that did that as women. Part of that, of course, is society. Women are not encouraged to go into math. They never really have been. Nevertheless, that uh, so this side tends to seem to be able to deal with it because it's step-by-step. Step. This is the step-by-step step side of the brain. This side of the brain can count great. The other side of the brain, the right hemisphere, can't count, can't count past three. Everything above three is just many. You see that also in a lot of very primitive cultures, which don't have a written or much of an oral language. They tend to only count up to three, and they have the next number as many. However, this side of the brain ought to function better, and probably does in higher math, algebra, trigonometry, stuff where you're not really using numbers. You're really using uh, images. Um, a plus A squared plus B squared equals C squared and so on. That's not numbers. That's symbols. This side of the brain tends to process symbols. Probably, now that looks like it ought to give women the advantage in higher math. The reason I would think that it doesn't is that if you're going to succeed in math in schools, you have to fill in all the steps. Filling in the steps is this side of the brain. Forming overall patterns is that side of the brain. If you went through high school math, and you always got your, so you always got things marked wrong because you had their answer right, but you couldn't put the steps in. You were probably dominated. You probably have a dominant right hemisphere of the brain. Or if you always knew the answer, and then because they always require the steps, you got the answer, and then you worked your way backwards putting the steps in. That would tend to mean that you tend to have a dominant right hemisphere of the brain. Now the fact that math requires all the steps to be in puts people who are intuitive who are able to recognize the pattern as a whole at a disadvantage and may well be why uh, males tend to dominate in math, not because they're really better at higher math, but because they're better at the step-by-step -step, uh, putting things together. The left hemisphere of the brain tends to be the more practical side of the brain. It's good at planning stuff. Remember, it's good at, see it, at putting stuff together step-by-step-by-step. -by -step -by -step. If you're going to plan something, you need to be able to figure out what you have and where you need to put it and and in what order it tends to go. The other side of the brain tends to be more visionary. It deals with dreams rather than plans. Overall goals. This is what I want the place to look like. I'm going to build a castle. This is what I want the castle to look like. That overall vision tends to come out of here. But if you only have that side of the brain, you'll never get the castle built. You'll know what you want, but you won't be able to get, you won't be able to think, no, wait a minute, I need the bricks and then I need the cement, and if, oh, I forgot, I needed to dig the foundation first. No, too bad, I have to tear all that down again. Step-by-step -step side of the brain, then. Plans, practical in that sense. The left hemisphere of the brain likes rules and regulations and precedent. Precedent, of course, is what has happened before. The last time we came to this situation, how did it work out? Uh, and again, it likes rules and an order to things. It's good at taking stuff and putting it into categories. Well, if you're going to put it into categories, you have to have rules for where things go. If you work step by step, rules help you to work there, too. There's nothing, neither one of these sides of the brain is better than the other. And it's not even better to be dominated by one side more than the other. They're both useful. But of course, the, the trick is to apply which brain to the task. 
the right hemisphere, on the other hand, tends to be uh, impulsive and to deal primarily with feelings, with emotions, and with sensations. This brain likes sensations. Um, if you look down there in number 15, this brain's first question is, how does it feel? This brain's first question is, what does it mean? If you come up and kiss somebody who's dominated by the left, by the right hemisphere of the brain, they go, ooh, that was nice. Do that again. I like that. If you come up and kiss somebody who's dominated by this side of the brain, they go, why did you do that? <laughs> They're not interested in the sensation. Now, it may be, in fact, that one of the functions of the left hemisphere of the brain is to inhibit the natural emotional responses that come out of this right hemisphere of the brain. A recent study showed that people who have uh, extreme phobias, fears of things, particularly fears of animals, tend to be people who have either a balanced brain or have one in which the left hemisphere is not dominant. And the reason for that, of course, is this side generates the emotions. Remember the limbic system? shoots a little bit of that natural morphine in there to get its attention, and that tends to generate the emotions anyway. So you have this emotional response generating out of this side of the brain. That goes across the corpus callosum, and then the brain on the other side says, let's not get carried away here. No need to panic. We'll figure this out. If you don't have that side of the brain to say, don't panic, this side of the brain is going, ah, ah, ah. and there's nobody here to say, calm down, it's all right. Everything can be solved. There's a reasonable explanation for all this. So naturally, those people then would tend to have phobias. Again, lateralization, this being the emotional side of the brain. Um, later on, you'll see when we move into the different literary movements that, on the one hand, romanticism and metaphysical, the romantic, so on, tends to emphasize emotion. They tend to be people who believe that emotion is the, is the key to what literature ought to be all about. The other side tends uh, to emphasize the intellectual. Thinking is what everything's supposed to be about, not feeling. That set of contradictions has never really been resolved. And in fact, it may not even be resolvable. That uh, thing about the two sides of the brain also leads into another uh, point that's made up in that paragraph. And that's the parallel between uh, Freud's idea about how the mind works and Sperry's idea. Uh, Freud's Basic idea. Well, Freud has two. There are two flaws with Freud. First of all, he put his theories together based on the patients that he saw. The patients that he saw lived in a culture which was probably the most sexually repressive culture that ever existed. Uh, the 19 teens and 20s, Victorian Germany. Uh, probably even more repressive than uh, even the Puritan era in America. Now, with that, the reason that skewed Freud's data and caused him to think that everything was rooted in sex was because almost everybody who came in to see him had sexual dysfunction. Their problem was sex, but the problem wasn't them. The problem was that they lived in a crazy society. And, he, and most of his patients were also women. Women were more sexually repressed then, of course, than men were, so they had more problems. Anybody who had a normal sex drive in, uh, in Freud's Germany felt guilty about it. And came to him and said, I have these terrible, horrible dreams that are all full of, of uh, erotic images and so on, and I, I don't know what to do about it. So he assumed, because everybody he saw seemed to have problems with sex, that sex was at the basis of everything. When, in fact, we know now that that is not entirely the case. There are people who have perfectly satisfactory sex lives who are still a mess because their jobs don't work out right. In fact, what you do... Um, for a living, the work that you do may have as much to do with your emotional well-being as anything else. If you're not happy in your job, it tends to destroy the rest of your relationship. So one of the flaws in Freud is that he overlooked that whole series. Another flaw was that he never could really establish physical structures that parallel the structures that he said were there psychologically. He said really there are, there are three basic structures. First of all is the id. The id has all the instinctual drives, hunger, thirst, sex, fear. Um, this is the side, he sort of pictured it as the, uh, as almost an animal that lives inside of us. It always wants, wants, wants things. It's counterbalanced by, in his theory, another, uh, another part of the psychology, another part of the mind, called the superego. The superego has all of the rules, what's good and what's bad. The superego generally gets its rules from society, from your parents from church, school, whatever, however the culture imposes those things. But it has all the stuff here that you ought to do. 
Now, the, those two are always in conflict, or generally in conflict in Freud's theories. So they need a mediator, because the, the id looks around and goes, I want that, and goes to reach for it, and then the superego immediately jumps in and goes, you don't own that. That's not yours. Leave your hands off that. That's naughty. Don't touch that. So, the, And they're both equally strong. So what they needed was a mediating um, mechanism, and the mediating mechanism Freud called the ego. And the ego's job was to orient both of those drives towards reality, basically to form compromises between the id that wanted all this stuff and the superego who had all the rules about what you were allowed to have and what you weren't allowed to have. Now, that may well correspond to Spiri's idea of the way the brain is shaped. Over here in the right hemisphere, we have the emotional side of the brain, the, uh, the side which has all the basic drives, the impulsive side, again, the strongly emotional side. And over in this side of the brain, we have the step-by-step, -step, logical, rules-oriented side. And the part that makes the compromises between the two, the bridge of tissue, the corpus callosum, in which these two sets of demands come together and are balanced out, or one dominates as opposed to the other. But it's in the corpus callosum where that integration between the two drives takes place. That now gives Freud, uh, gives a physiological basis. Science always want to see the mechanism. They want to know how it works. Where are the gears on this thing? One of the reasons Freud was uh, initially attacked, and maybe even somewhat later, besides the sexual bias in his in his work, was this idea that there wasn't any physical structures. Well, it may now be that there are physical structures and they correspond to these three parts of the brain. And that the corpus callosum is more or less a battleground, a bridge across which two armies fight for control. And sometimes one holds the bridge and sometimes another holds the bridge. And a lot of the time they have a ceasefire and they make a compromise on the bridge. So we switch back and forth between the two. The left hemisphere, Scene number, uh, number nine there tends to be analytical. He wants to analyze things, to find out what they mean, to break them down into smaller and smaller units. The right hemisphere of the brain is emotional. It just wants to feel good. The party, the, this is the brain that wants to party all the time. And this is the one that says, we have serious business to do here. Let's get down to work. We have homework now. We can't go up. <laughs> this is the side of the brain that says, who cares about it? Now is the moment. May also be that this side would also be the time-oriented side, the side that you know uh, arranges stuff, arranges events in a time structure, and that this emotional side doesn't have a real concept of time. It lives in the now. So that when you say to this side of the brain, "We'll do it later," there is no later for this side. It wants it immediately. It corresponds to, to Freud's hungry id. What it wants, it wants now. And then we have the other side, which has a time framework, which goes, "No, no." We have business to do now. We'll do that at a different time. Can you go home and explain it to my parents that right hemisphere? <laughs> <laughs> because you want to party all the time? I don't know. They would tend to be... Yeah, I might, it might work, you know, because they would tend to be... If they're from my generation, they'll tend to be left hemisphere people. Their initial response will be that you should get your, that you should get your left hemisphere working and, and stop letting your right hemisphere dominate. But it might help to convince them. <coughs> Of course, if you really succeed, though, you might turn them into right hemisphere people, and then you'll go home and uh, there'll be no food on the table because they'll all be wrecked sitting around watching the soap operas. And we don't go to work anymore. We decided you were right. The right brain is, is perfectly right. There is only now, and there's no tomorrow, so we better get it while it's here, while we're here. In fact, you'll see those attitudes really expressed um, in romanticism and, and rationalism when we get to when we get to them. Actually, you should be able to use a lot of this stuff on your parents or anybody else once you learn to manipulate those ideas. In other words, one of the advantages to this, say you're a business major, um, if you could figure out who the romantics are, your sales approach to them will be geared entirely differently than the sales approach to somebody who's dominated by the left hemisphere of the brain. In other words, you present a lot of rational arguments to them about why the product you want to sell them is real good if they're left hemisphere. If they're right hemisphere people, you want to show them how it's got a really pretty can, yeah. it's got a nice color, it smells good, you can spray it, and it's nice to spray, the thing doesn't stick, you know. All of the sensational parts of it is the way you would address your thing. So actually these ideas should come in handy in a lot of, a lot of different uh, areas.
primarily, you can think of the left hemisphere of the brain as the practical businessman. The one who keeps the books, the one who's there every day from 9 to 5, the one who likes routine and rules and regulations. And you can't denigrate that. I mean, that's, it. that's important. Society doesn't run if you have all right hemisphere people. Maybe even if you have a lot of uh, a lot of right hemisphere people, the society might even be in trouble because the trains don't run on time. If everybody just lives for the moment, nobody ever shows up for work, or they show up at 1.30, by which time other people who have shown up earlier said, well, on the other hand, there's a party next door, we'll go there, and they're gone by the time these people show up. So you really need the left hemisphere people, although generally, uh, if you, again, are pattern recognition people, you might not think that they're all that work well, but without them, things tend to fall apart. One of the reasons why romantics, right hemisphere people, never take over completely, because they can't get organized. The hippie revolution fell apart because they didn't have rules, regulations, practicality. You can't fight a revolution unless you can get the people with their guns to the right place at the right time. You got everybody lined up to get on the train to go where you're supposed to fight, and somebody starts passing out the dope and says, ah, oh, the hell with it, man, it's a nice day. <laughs> we'll fight them tomorrow, they'll still be there, they're always there. <laughs> Nothing ever gets done. You have to have some sense of organization. And, and the right hemisphere doesn't tend to be good at that, doesn't tend to be good at long-range plans. But it is good at establishing ideals, because that's always the problem with revolutions. You get right hemisphere people who stand up and say, this is the grand ideal we should go to. The only people who can get you there are the people from the left hemisphere. And when they get in control, they're the same pirates you just threw out. Because they have the same, we have to be there on time. The only people who can fight a successful war, the people who do that, they get in control. And for a brief period of time, you have some freedom. But eventually, you go back to control anyway, to the authoritarian side. The left hemisphere tends to be authoritarian. It likes there to be a sense of authority, a sense of rules that everybody knows. In fact, there's a kind of cyclic um, shift which you'll see that, that um, tends to go back and forth between these two structures, the, the completely free side and the very authoritarian side. Most people are in the middle. They like some structure, they like some freedom. Um, what generally happens, though, is that the, the structure people get in control. And they like rules. Left hemisphere likes rules. They start making rules. And they make rules for everything. Well, after a while, there get to be so many rules that the, big, that the people in the middle, who like some rules, begin to go, this is really tyrannical. We can't. This is. This has got to be stopped. And of course, there's always the people who don't like any rules at all, who are always whispering in the ear of the great majority, saying, "Hey, we don't need all these rules. Let's get rid of them." Well, after the rules become oppressive, the majority tends to turn towards the side that doesn't want rules at all, and they come into power for a while, and that's good because they get rid of a lot of the old rules. The problem is they get usually get rid of most of the rules, and rules have a function. They save us a lot of time in terms of how we react with one another. In other words, social conventions and traditions, which seem like they're, they shouldn't even exist, like they have no real value, have the value in that they make us comfortable in terms of knowing how we need to react with one another. But when the non-rules people get in, for a period of time there, nobody knows how to react. Revolutions, social revolutions, things which change a culture, are always uncomfortable uh, for people who like some sort of sense of order. And then what generally happens is there gets to be no rules. The great mass of people in the middle go, well, I didn't like a lot of rules, but this no rules at all is too scary. And so then they just lean back to the other side, the rules people, and they come back into power. And then they start making more rules again. They make too many rules, and the anti-rules people get to take over again. And we have this cyclic nature back and forth, back and forth. It occurs in cultures. It occurs in literature. Those um, series of different literary forms at the bottom, classical, uh, the Renaissance, neoclassical, rational, realistic, naturalistic, existential, uh, which we're going to cover, and we'll be covering these things in pairs so you can see the contrast between them, all really parallel the left hemisphere of the brain. The uh, medieval, the reformation, the metaphysical, the romantic, impressionistic, anti-realistic, etc., <coughs> tend to correspond to the right hemisphere of the brain. They're the emotionally oriented. And you, these things replace one another in a cyclic fashion. The same thing that applies to society, too many rules, not enough experimentation and freedom, occurs also in literature and breaks down and has these cycles. Uh, 
again, the practical businessman is in the right hemisphere. The artistic dreamer is in the right hemisphere. The right hemisphere, by the way, is particularly good at, at uh, spatial relationships. That's one of the reasons why I was good at higher math. Instead of thinking of things in a line and as a series of numbers added to one another, the right brain tends to think of uh, you know, the A plus B plus C as things arranged in space. And by arranging those, when you set up a computer program, you usually see there's a flow chart first. Here's a big circle, represents this kind of information. It's going to go over to here. Um, a square block represents another kind of information. It goes over there. That's the pattern recognition side. That side tends to be extrapolative, intuitive. Uh, for example, the left hemisphere of the brain, if you put a dot here and a dot here and a dot way over there and ask what the, what the uh, curve is, the left hemisphere can't give you an answer. It doesn't have enough data. It's not good at pattern recognition. It's good at step by step. If you give it two dots and ask it where the third one is going to be, it'll probably be able to put it in. But if you put one way over there somewhere, it won't. However, the right hemisphere of the brain, which is used to working on small amounts of data, you give it a little amount of data, it looks for the big picture. It knows where it fits in. It will be able to draw you the graph because it's able to extrapolate. It's able to function on much less information so that <clears throat> you can see how they both have a necessary kind of function. Uh, Aristotle, among the Greeks, the Greeks, by the way, may well have developed the culture they did because they were in a unique position. They had access to cultures dominated by different sides of the brain. The, uh, the big empires to the east of Greece, Persian Empire, uh, the Egyptian Empire, most of those empires were right hemisphere empires. They had a strong uh, central government, a big bureaucracy. The reason for that, of course, is because they were based on a, an agrarian uh, society that was primarily used uh, irrigation. If you have a big irrigation system, you have to have somebody who can maintain that irrigation system. Single individual people or teeny groups of people can't do it. You need some sort of central authority. You also, and if you're growing that many crops, you also need somebody to defend them. That, again, requires armies. Armies and the irrigation system require bureaucracies to keep them going. And that, of course, leads to central government. Central government can only function if it has a lot of very strict rules that it applies. So, the, uh, on one hand, the Greeks were exposed to this uh, right hemisphere set of cultures. They also, though, had access to the people who had initially, when mankind spread out, had gone up into the forests of Europe. Now, in the forests of Europe, you don't need the right hemisphere nearly as much, because in forests, you don't do a lot of farming. You're primarily a hunting society. Hunting societies don't need large bureaucracies. 500 people out hunting scare the game away. You hunt in small groups. So uh, they would tend to be oriented towards the emotional side. Um, without any kind of a central government. Indeed, that's the way the, uh, most of the uh, upper European cultures tended to develop. They weren't big, they didn't develop societies with large central governments and big bureaucracies. They were primarily tribes. And the tribes were tied together on an emotional basis. The people who hunted together were bound by a mystical tie that allowed them to function together as a single unit but they didn't get their orders from somebody else 500 or 1,000 miles away. So their side tended to emphasize not organization and intellection and rules, but emotions. The greatest hunter is the bravest hunter, is the one who can take his courage and go into, the, go into the face of death continually. Well, you have to have belief. You have to have faith to continually put yourself in jeopardy. Rules won't do that for you. Now, the Greeks were able to, they had commerce with both of these kinds of cultures. And because of that, they tended to uh, have both sides represented in their culture. Now, it's true that in the, when we get to the classical period, you'll see that the classical period generally was dominated by the left hemisphere. More people paid attention to Aristotle probably than Plato. And Aristotle, remember, is responsible for Aristotelian logic. He also developed a philosophy of looking at the world called realism. And realism will come back a lot of times, too, and is the basis of a number of these um, theories and ideas which we'll be dealing with in literature. What realism essentially says is that the physical world, the world that we seem to perceive with our senses, is the real, true, and only world. 
What you see is what you get. Now, Plato and the idealists had a completely different version of things. They thought that the physical world was not real in itself, but was only a distorted reflection of a set of ideals. In other words, every table was a distorted reflection of a non-physical idea table that existed somewhere outside of the physical world. Every human being was, in fact, a distorted reflection of an ideal individual who existed outside of space and time in the physical world. Uh, Plato develops a thing called the allegory of the cave. And in that he says that what mankind is like, it's like we're all chained to our chairs and we're looking at this wall. Behind us is a big fire. Between us and the fire, people go by carrying objects on their heads. The shadows of those objects are cast on the far wall. Because we cannot turn around and look at the objects directly, we don't even know they're there. We think that the shadows that flicker on the far wall are reality when in fact they're only a distorted reflection of the true reality which goes on behind our heads. Now the only way that you can know the true reality, you can see into the ideal world, is by intuition. You cannot reason your way there. You can only get there by sudden insight or by revelation. You can see how this idealism, as it's called, is really also the basis of religion. Most religions also believe that this world is not the real world. This world is a symbolic world in which all of the actions are significant, not for what they cause here, but for their effect on a larger cosmic world which exists outside of physical reality. Idealism, of course, has come down eventually and becomes our romanticism and, and uh, the metaphysical, and, and it's fairly strong in the medieval world as well. Um, this difference, though, between thinking whether or not this is the real world actually has some modern underpinning to it, too. Science, which we tend to worship in the 20th century as being the ultimate source of authority and knowledge, uh, in the 19th century, most people in America, at least, referred to the Christian Bible as the ultimate source of authority. In other words, if they had an argument with you, they would say to you, the Bible says. People don't say that now to solve arguments. To solve arguments, they say, science has found, research has shown, studies have proven. When in fact, science, research, and studies never actually prove anything. Um, on a philosophical level, there is no such thing as a fact in science. There's only a temporary understanding of things. In other words, what seems to be true in science cannot be said to be absolutely true until all of the evidence is in. All of the evidence will not be in until the universe ends. No scientists will be around after that to find out what was the truth, but that doesn't disturb them. Until all the evidence is in, though, you don't have a fact. You have a tentative fact. You have a probability don't have a certainty. And yet, we assign to science this idea of certainty. You know, people believe that science has the truth. In fact, it doesn't even by its own standards have the truth. It has a tentative truth, an approximate truth, a probable truth, one which may turn out to be true and may, not, may turn out not to be true. Uh, the idealist type uh, concept of the world, what, before I get on to that, even from the rational scientific view of the world, what we see isn't really what's here. For example, this table is 99.99999% empty space. It's made up of atoms. The atom has what is it, a neutron and a proton and a number of electrons flying around outside it, wherever it is. In any case, there's a big space in between them. The protons and the electrons are teeny, teeny, teeny things. It's like looking at the, uh, at the uh, solar system. Sure, we've got a lot of big planets, but if you compare the planets to the volume of space that they move around in, the solar system is mostly empty space. The atom is mostly empty space. This is made up of atoms. This is mostly empty space. The world isn't the solid, um, indestructible thing that we think it is. Now, from the idealistic version, we also have some indication that the world isn't what we think it is. In fact, and this relates to the difference between sensation and perception. If, if the realists were right, and the, real, the physical world is the only world, they assume that what we take in from the physical world is the truth. In other words, what we see of the physical world is what's out there. That's not so. For example, sight is edited 
at five different locations before it gets up to the brain and is perceived as sight. More, more than that, even, there's a hole in all of your vision. There's a little space at the back of the eye where the optic nerve comes in, which hasn't got any rods or cones. It's not sensitive to light. So in other words, when you look at something, there's a little hole in it, out of both eyes. We never see the hole, though. The reason we never see the hole is, let's say, we look like a single frame, and there's the hole. Then the eyes move slightly to this side, and the hole now moves over. Well, we know what's where the hole is now, and we can see what's where the hole is, where the hole was before. In other words, we've got the information filled in by shifting back and forth. As it goes through different structures in the brain, then put those two overlapping images together and give us a single image in which there isn't any hole. But that's not the way the vision actually comes in. Um, in fact, there are little, one of the places where decisions are made about what information gets passed on to the brain is in the eye itself. A certain number of photons have to hit a particular rod before it fires. And a certain number of rods have to fire before another impulse is sent further on to a, to a, a second changing station. So in other words, we don't even see what's out there. We have a, almost a, a sub-brain in our eye editing the information that comes in. All of what we take as the world is our perception of the world. And perception is not sensation. Perception is edited sensation. One, uh, same thing happens with the ear. Hearing is edited in, in three or four different areas. In fact, the only sensation which goes directly to the brain without editing is the sense of smell. Because the olfactory bulb is itself a part of the brain. There's a little postage stamp area up here at the top of your nose and the molecules fit in the lock and key relationship and that information goes right up to the brain. That's probably why psychologists have found that the most vivid memories are those that are generated by smell. Somebody shows you a picture of your elementary school, you'll have a memory. But if, if you get a whiff of that soap that they wash all elementary schools with, <coughs> you're back there instantaneously for a minute. Those sensations are, it's as if it, it's happening all over again. But the rest of our sensations are all edited, and edited in a whole lot of different ways. Well, first of all, what we take into the world isn't even what's out there. We're sitting here in the bottom of an ocean, a big ocean of air. We don't seem to notice that. We're also sitting in an ocean of magnetism. Nobody can see it. Moreover, we're here, this room is filled with infrared radiation. All of us are really chemical furnaces. You could even think of continually oxidizing. You can think of people as candles. We get lit when we're born, and we oxidize our entire material. When we've oxidized it all, we dead. That may be what getting old is. You're burning yourself up, and you begin to shrivel as you oxidize your, your material. Now, all of us are sitting here, these little chemical uh, furnaces with infrared energy flowing up off all of us. If we could see in infrared, what you would see when you looked around the room would be vague shapes of people inside of columns of rising, radiating energy. And if that's out there, and yet we're not, we're not aware of it. We're not aware of the magnetism. We're not aware, really, of gravity all that much. Um, there are all kinds of energies surrounding us which are not available to us. Our, our window on the world is a very, very narrow window. I mean, it's an impressive window. We can hear um, from, I think it's from 15 to 20 or 25,000 cycles per second different variations of sound. But compared to all of the possible vibrations there are, that's not awfully big. In other words, we're, we're limited even in our sensation of the world. And then our limited sensation of the world is further acted upon by our perception, by the organizing structures in the brain, which may even be inborn. So in other words, we can't even take in with our senses what's really out in the physical world. And when we do take it in, the brain imposes structures on it which perhaps distort it and change it. It may be that the world isn't at all the way that we see or think that it is. It may be completely different, but we are forced to see it with these sensory apparatus and then with the structures that um, are built into our brains. And everybody sees it differently. That's another thing. We all have differences. For example, if I put a whole lot of dots up on this board, put them up random, and didn't tell you why they were up there, most of us would look at them and begin to see, ooh, there's three dots in a row. There's a little triangle of dots. There's a half circle of dots. In other words, now those patterns aren't inherent in the dots. Finding those 
patterns is inherent in our brain. And that may be the way it is with the rest of, phys of physical reality. In other words, we only see what we are prepared to see. And some of that is wired into our brains already, and some of it is culturally conditioned. Uh, you can't find things that you don't believe are out there. If you think that something doesn't exist, you're not going to be able to see it. There are cultures in which people see ghosts all of the time. Everybody in the village walks past the, uh, the burial ground in the center, and they see the ghosts of their ancestors. And they see them. They literally see them. But if you take a Westerner there, he can walk right up to the ghosts and not even see them at all. Because Now, that doesn't mean that there are necessarily ghosts there. What it means is that the culture has imposed a pattern on people that allows them to see things whether they're there or not. Um, you can see it all the time in, in uh, say, misprints and things. Uh, I don't have, there's a slide that says, uh, so you have a triangular sign that says, go to right, but it really says, go to to right. There's two twos in it. Most people will not see the second two. Most people will just ignore it because they don't expect it to be there. That's a pattern that's been culturally imposed. So over on the ideal side, the side that says the world is not the world, they may well be right. The world may only be the habits of perception which we are trained to accept and the basic wired-in biological um, perceptions which we're conditioned to. We may not be able to see the world. The idealists may be right. There may be vastly more to existence than we think there is. Um, there's an effect to take a, a rationalist approach to that. Our whole perception of time is just that, a perception. It's a result of our sensations. A guy named, uh, I think it's Zeno of Athens, another Greek naturally. It's probably why the Greeks came up again with all those ideas which are still current in our culture. Most of those questions were asked by the Greeks. They may even have been asked probably before that, but they were asked especially by them. And they've never really been fully answered. Maybe they can't really even be, um, be fully answered. See no that that's right. You know what happened. Did you know what happened just there? The right hemisphere of my brain, which organizes all of this, says, okay, this is where we're going next. It has the general pattern. The right side of my brain, which fills in the bit by bit this, the detailed information, started filling in details. Filled in its details, and then it said, where do we go next? And the right hemisphere of the brain said, find out for yourself, smart guy. Where we're going next is Zeno of Athens, of course. So I still had it recorded there, but that's, that lost it. The right hemisphere of the brain was in charge of the bridge, the corpus callosum, lost it. Now it's got it back again. Zeno of Athens said, time doesn't exist. In fact, time cannot exist, because in order to have time, you have to have motion. You have to have sequence. Um, before I can walk to the door, I have to walk halfway to the door. And before I walk halfway there, I have to walk half that distance. And before I walk half that distance, I have to walk half that distance, and half that distance, and half that distance. There's an infinite series of halves. I can never complete it, because I can never get to the first half because there's always a half of that distance. Motion is therefore impossible. So we can't get all the way over there because we can never get halfway to halfway to halfway to halfway to halfway. Um, <clears throat> what Zeno, that people said to him, well, how come it seems like we move around? Zeno said, you don't move around. Consciousness moves around. That's the only thing that moves. What we have is an infinite plane of events. Everything that ever can or will happen is already there, like little statues. Halfway, 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 halfway. An infinite number of statues there. Consciousness plays across those statues. Just the way when, we, when you show a film. Nothing moves on a film. You have a series of still pictures. If they go by at 18 frames per second, you don't notice the flashing and the blank screen in between, and we see motion. That's what Zeno says happens in real life. In real life, nothing moves around. Only consciousness moves across a series of fixed frames which are there and permanent forever. Some support for Zeno comes from... Now, Zeno's right. One of the reasons why we would seem to perceive things as time would be, um, again, rooted in our physiology. Nerve impulses don't travel at the speed of light. 
fact, they only travel about as fast as propeller-driven air, uh, airplane. I mean, if you, if you hit your thumb with a hammer, it seems like you knew instantly. But in fact, it took some time. If your arm were 20 miles long, there would be a, a period of time where you could see the pain running down your arm. Actually, it only goes to the spinal column and then right back to get your hand out of the way and then it goes up to the brain. But um, It travels at a relatively slow rate. Now, because of that, it means that we can only take in whatever information is out there. Let's assume that everything that could exist, say Zeno was right, everything's out there. We can only take it in a little bit at a time because of our sensory apparatus. In other words, time is not an artifact of the world. Time is an artifact of our brains and our sensory apparatus because they are not instantaneous, because they're a lag in them. We have to view things bit by bit by bit. That gives us the illusion of sequence and the illusion of time. But in fact, time may not even exist. Time doesn't exist. That puts us right back into the idealist camp of there being complete and perfect forms which exist outside of time. In that case, all of us would be perfect in our overall life cycle, but would seem to be imperfect as we go through it step by step. In other words, we, if, when you get to the end of your life and pop back out into the ideal world and become part of the ideal human being again, and we're able to perceive that, you would see it in its totality and be able to say, all in all, that was a pretty artistic life I had. It seemed pretty miserable at the time, and I was unhappy a lot, but looked at from the grand perspective, it was beautiful. Again, that requires us to move outside of the illusion of time. We have other illusions, of course, also, which may be conditioned into our brains and may be a part of our physiology. For example, everybody's got a different biochemistry to them. Same chemicals, but different amounts in different people. Let's say you're a person who has a, just a slightly... Um, overactive all adrenal gland. Got a lot of adrenaline in there, so you're always revved up. When you're presented with information, you may be the kind of person then who jumps to conclusions because you're used to working at a really fast rate of speed. Somebody else who had an underactive adrenal gland, had less adrenaline in them, worked, would work very, very slow, would tend to be a placid person. If you give them a whole mass of information. They might work their way very slowly through it and eventually come to the same conclusion you came to, but in an entirely different way. It'll take them a lot longer to do it. So in other words, our physiology determines whether or not we pay attention to patterns or whether we pay attention to detail. Um, the old cliche about optimist and pessimist. You know, there's a glass that's, that's half filled with water, I think. There's a glass there's half a glass of water. <laughs> the optimist looks at it and says, oh, it's half full. And the pessimist looks at it and says, it's half empty. Same glass of water, different set of perceptions. That may be based in what kind of chemicals are in his brain. The optimist may just be people who have a lot of the enkephalins pouring in all the time. They're happy all the time because they're wrecked. Oh, a whole half a glass of water. Good, I'll pour it on myself, see how it feels. Whereas the pessimist who's not got a lot of enkephalins, one of the functions of the enkephalins, that natural opium, by the way, wasn't just so that people could uh, recreationally go crazy, because that's really what happens to you from a rationalist uh, standpoint. Um, having too much of the enkephalins, having artificial drugs, is really a way of being crazy as far as the realists are concerned. Um, one of the reasons for that, the chemical developing, is of course it had, a, it had an advantage for survival. In other words, if you have natural morphine in your body, and the saber-toothed tiger comes along and takes a bite out of it, if you don't have any enkephalins, you're going to lay there writhing on the ground, screaming and hollering while he chews off your other leg, your arm, and your head. But if you've got enkephalin, as soon as he bites you, the brain shoots out all, this, all of these natural morphine. You don't feel that leg. You can get up and run away. Those who got the enkephalins run away. They survive a lot oftener than the people who didn't have this good enkephalin system and tended to get eaten. That means they passed on their... They had children. They passed on their genes and their tendency to have a better enkephalin system, and that's probably how we eventually got to it. That thing of, uh, of uh, drugs, by the way, which will... Uh, come back because drugs do play a part in literature. The romantics in particular are very strong uh, on the use of drugs. And you can see why, being right hemisphere people, they would be uh, tend towards drugs because to them, the only thing that's important is emotion and sensation. 
drugs tend to enhance emotion and sensation. They don't, however, do very well with the other side of the brain. To a rationalist, the worst thing you could possibly do is to take any kind of chemical or anything else that would shut off this hemisphere. To a, to a left hemisphere person, the thing that separates us from the animals is this rational part of our brain. What kind of a maniac would throw away, even temporarily, that gift, that thing that separates us from, from all of the other beings, which are completely at the, at the, under the control of their emotions? To a left hemisphere person, drugs are a tremendous taboo because they take away what it is about you that makes you human. Uh, the right hemisphere people, though, like them because they seem to increase sensation. That's why there are recreational drugs, because they seem to increase sensation. In fact, they don't increase sensation. What they do is to knock out those editing stations on the way between the sensory apparatus and final perception. So in other words, um, normally you have a certain amount of sensation coming in. It gets filtered out at these different editing stations. You can see it when you go to study. You can study by an, empty, by an open window with traffic going by all the time. After a little while, you won't hear the traffic anymore. But if somebody comes in and whispers your name, even not as loud as the traffic, you'll pro and probably your attention will come back and be focused on them. The traffic didn't get any quieter. It stayed the same, but you didn't hear it after a while. The reason you didn't hear it is because you have these editing stations, which are programmed. After that pattern comes up a couple times, higher centers in the brain go, we know there's traffic out there. I don't care about the traffic. Unless it sounds like a car is coming through the wall, don't bother us with that anymore. Do send up anything new, though, that comes in. And that's why when somebody comes in and whispers your name, that, that thing gets passed right on up to the brain. Now, when people take drugs, it blocks out those centers. So the traffic noise, which was being damp, dampened in the editing centers, is no longer being dampened. And it seems like people are being overwhelmed by a flood of sensations when in fact all they've really done is gotten rid of this side of the brain and gotten rid of the editing stations in between. And of course, to a right hemisphere person, who cares? A right hemisphere person says, I don't care whether I'm getting more sensation or not as long as it feels like I'm getting more sensation. Remember, feeling is what's important to that side of the brain. The emotions, I'm happier or whatever. The other side of the brain is the analysis that's more important. They don't want more sensation. In fact, more sensation is quite often a liability to the other side of the brain. And of course, the reason for that is if you've got too much information, one of the ways that this, uh, one of the ways to get uh, a shift, if you're normally a left hemisphere person and you want to shift and try processing with the other hemisphere of the brain, there are a number of things you can do. Most of them involve either increasing the amount of stimulation to the point where the right brain can't handle it. Remember, left brain, I'm sorry, left brain can't handle it. Remember, the left brain goes step by step. If you give it six things to deal with, it'll take the six things and start arranging them in order. If you give it 60 things, it's got to arrange the 60 things. In. If you give it 6,000 things, it's got to arrange them in order. But when you show that side of the brain 6,000 things, it goes, forget it. I'm never going to get to the end of this. I'll never make any sense out. It throws up its hands and shifts control over to the other side of the other side of the brain. Other side of the brain, give it 6,000 pieces of information. That's okay because it goes, ooh, I've got more stuff to make a picture out of. And it, the more information you give this side of the brain, the better. The more information you give this side, the more tendency it has to just throw up its hands and say, I can't handle this anymore. Let the pattern recognition side take over because that's when you have a massive data Pattern recognition is the best way to handle it. When you have to analyze data, though, of course, this is the better side to handle it. Realism, of course, leads again to science, which we now accept as being the, generally the, the basis for what's true in the world. And science requires experimentation. And we assume that because science experiments, because it looks at the world, it sees what's out there, and then it makes statistical judgments about um, what it sees, that it will necessarily come to the right conclusions, and its conclusions will be valid. May not be true. Um, from the left, from the right hemisphere side of the brain, one of the things that, uh, by the way, that science bases its validity on, 
and, and the, the left hemisphere embraces its validity now, is mathematics, is numbers. The side of the brain is good at numbers. It likes to count stuff. You want to prove something in science? You have to have something measurable. In other words, you have to have something to count. If you have something to count, science can't make any kind of a judgment on it. From the right hemisphere's view, though, that's all based, all of science is based on mathematics, and mathematics is nonsense. Even actually from the left-handed perspective, when you think about it, if you have a rule, it ought to be true all the time, if it's the truth. And yet math is full of things which are true, except and except and except and except and except. That's magic. That's not really, that's not really rationality. It's not really logic. Also, statistics. A lot, of, a lot of science is based on statistical verification of things. How many of you have had statistics? Oh, you should take statistics and teach you to lie with numbers. Take literature, because that teaches you to lie with words. But statistics, you can give, if you give me any set of, set of statistics, I think I will probably be able to prove two completely opposite things from the same set of, set of statistics. That's the advantage to it. You don't like the way things are coming out, <coughs> you're looking for what most people do, and you've got this series of, of numbers about what they do, you average them. But the average comes out to be 50, and you wanted everybody to seem like they had 75. So what do you do then? You change it around. You look for the mean score, and then that'll move it up a little bit, or you look for another score. Or else, you throw away a whole lot of scores, and that moves the average up to where you want it. It's easy to eliminate the scores, because in any kind of an experiment, you will always have data which doesn't clearly fall on one side or the other. There will always be a bunch that will fall in the middle that might go either way. Which side you shift that block to, will determine what outcome you want. So from the right hemisphere side, science is all nonsense because it's all based on mathematics and mathematics is all nonsense because it's got so many contradictions in it because you can manipulate it any way you want. So if you raise scientific arguments to the right hemisphere of the brain, it doesn't care. In fact, actually, the right hemisphere of the brain doesn't want to listen. The right hemisphere of the brain goes, I don't want to see all those numbers. Numbers are so boring. You know, give me something to do. Give me something with some sensation in it. Give me some pictures to look at. All of the ones look the same. You want to show me ones? Give me some old English ones and some Arabic ones and some, I want some colored ones, some red ones and some green ones and stuff. Then I'll pay attention to it. This side of the brain, however, is looking for the quantity that's involved. Now, these, of course, will also eventually lead to the basic uh, literary movements, which you see listed below. The classical, they're also involved in the Renaissance. The Renaissance is a rediscovery of information. It heavily emphasized the intellectual, the thinking, as opposed to the feeling part. And we get to the, all of the forms of Romanticism there from the medieval art. They will tend to emphasize the emotional side the extrapolative side, the religious side also. Right hemisphere of the, of the brain uh, tends to deal with faith rather than fact. In fact, from a religious point of view, you couldn't have a reasonable act of faith. In other words, um, take the existence of a supreme being. You have to get to that from the right hemisphere side. Because on the left hemisphere side, there's so much evidence that there couldn't possibly be a supreme being, or if there was one, he would have to be crazy. What kind of a being would create AIDS? Autoimmune deficiency. What kind of a supreme being? 19th century, really worried about this. What kind of a supreme being would uh, invent the ichneumon wasp? The ichneumon wasp lands on a caterpillar, <coughs> sticks its ovipositor in it, or drills a hole into the caterpillar, and deposits its eggs in there. The eggs hatch and then eat the caterpillar alive. They're very clever eggs when they hatch. They don't eat any bilorgans. They eat around them until they're grown sufficiently, and then they eat the bilorgans last and eat their way out. That's pretty sick. What kind of a being could create something like that? On the rational side, you couldn't believe in the existence of a supreme being. However, the right brain finds that no problem whatsoever because in order to have faith, you have to act in not along with, in other words, if there were proof of the existence of a supreme being, 
believing in a supreme being would not be an act of faith. It would be an act of rationality. To have faith, you have to go in direct defiance of what everything on the rational side of your brain tells you. And that, of course, tells you that there is a supreme being. That requires a, a leap of faith. It also requires seeing things from a larger perspective. For example, one of the reasons why it would seem to a left-brain, rational, scientifically oriented person that there couldn't be a supreme being is because there's so much misery and terrible stuff that happens in the world. So that looks like there couldn't be one. However, the right brain would simply look at that and go, that doesn't matter. All this is, is a distorted reflection anyway. In other words, if you paint the mirror red or you paint the mirror green, it doesn't change what's real. To the right side of the brain, um, the things which seem to be terrible in life are not terrible because we don't die. That's the real drawback to science and the, right, and the left hemisphere. The left hemisphere says you die. That's it. The physical world is the only world. And you die in the physical world. Your body will decay, you'll burn, you'll oxidize all of your fuel, and you'll be gone. Science, in fact, cannot see any life beyond the life that we have, because it is limited to what's measurable and to what's here in the seemingly physical world. But to the right hemisphere of the brain, to the idealists in the world, none of that matters. We don't even exist here. We exist to the idealist in the ideal world. Um, from a, a religious standpoint, from the ideal perspective, none of us is anybody except God in disguise. We're all masks put on by the Supreme Being. And when the masks are taken off, the Supreme Being doesn't cease to exist. The portion that was in the mask doesn't cease to exist. It simply recognizes the whole of itself finally. So for the, for the right hemisphere of the brain, Misery in the world is not misery. It only seems to be misery because we are looking at it from a distorted perspective. We're looking at it from the perspective of the physical world. And the physical world is not important. I mean, it's important, but it's not the most important thing. The most important thing is what goes on out here in the ideal world. So there is a, to, a, to the right hemisphere of people, maybe that's why there's so much into emotion, um, they can afford to be happy because they don't have to worry that the Rational conclusions are that human, rationally we've got to expect that if mankind doesn't uh, destroy himself, he will eventually cease to exist anyway. The best bet for evolution is the beetles. No, not the beetle beetles, because obviously one of them already disappeared. Um, you know, B-E-T-L-E-S. There are more species of those than there are anything else. So they're the most likely to make it through. We're not all that likely to make it. Um, so from the rational perspective, you'd have to think mankind was going to die off. But from the idealist version, from the right hemisphere version, we can't become extinct because we're not here anyway. We're somewhere else. This is just an illusion. This is all a dream. And when we wake from this dream into the ideal world, we'll look back at it and go, hey, great dream. Scary, but nice. Or erotic, but nice. But either way, it's a good dream. Sure, there were Rick Newman, there were Newman wasps that ate up the caterpillars. And that looked terrible. But once we got outside of it, we saw that the caterpillars were an illusion and the wasps were an illusion, or the wasps and the caterpillars were simply other forms of God in disguise. Was God disguised as a caterpillar? And God is disguised as a wasp. How can God hurt himself? He eats himself up as a caterpillar? And what does that matter? The caterpillar's gone, God's still God. The supreme being is still there. The ideal world still exists. The ideal of caterpillars, of which all caterpillars take a uh, part, still exists. So there is no reason to be unhappy or sad. Everything goes on forever. We're immortal from the right side of the brain. And if we're immortal anyway, then we might as well have a good time while we're here, which would also fall in with the right side of the brain's idea that it really ought to be a party all the time. It's the rational side that says life is terrible and hard. In fact, the pessimistic side of the brain probably is the left hemisphere, actually. think about it, because the left hemisphere says we die. If you're not going to get out of this alive, that makes it pretty depressing. The right hemisphere, on the other hand, would be optimistic because it says you can't die because you're not even alive. We're not even here. All this is an illusion. Come to think of it, you really don't have any proof that you're here, you know. This could be a bad dream. 
You may wake up from this at any instant. All of you have almost certainly had the dreams where you're running from something, and then you wake up, and your heart is beating, and you're breathing hard. While you're in that dream and running, I mean, there are a couple kinds of dreams. There are dreams in which you're dreaming and something is chasing you, and another part of you is going, it's only a dream, don't worry about it. But there are those other dreams where whatever is chasing you is really chasing you, and when it catches you, it's going to eat you or whatever, or you're falling, and when you hit the bottom, that's going to be it while the dream exists. It's only when we wake up that the dream becomes unreal. Lo Tzu has a great parable on that. It said, once there was a man who dreamt he was a butterfly, and when he woke up, he wasn't sure whether he was a man who had dreamt he was a butterfly or a butterfly who was still dreaming that he was a man. There's no way to know until you wake up whether you really came here or whether this is all just a bad dream and you'll wake up at home in your, in your bed and go, boy, I wasn't in that crazy place. Ideas like that flowing around. There's no way to know until you're in that state. Uh, the dream state, in fact, does seem to use the right hemisphere more than the left hemisphere. So it may be that when we go to sleep, we perceive the world as it actually is, the ideal world. And when we're awake, we perceive only the physical part of the world. But again, it, decide, it depends on which of the two brains that you tend to be associated with, which dominates it. Anybody have any questions on that, what we've covered so far? Brilliant people. Um, the four critical approaches and their assumptions. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, what dominates creativity? It's generally thought to be the right hemisphere. Because in order to be creative, you have to put stuff together in new ways. This side of the brain has its rules. It can't go beyond its rules very well. Um, probably, though, the carrying out, science even, um, the creative part of science really probably comes out of this hemisphere. Because if you notice, whenever there's a breakthrough in science, it's always somebody who was carrying out an experiment to do one thing and found something else or had a dream. A lot of stuff comes out of dreams. Einstein's whole theory came out of a dream that he had. He was on a trolley, moving away from a clock. The benzene ring was discovered in a dream. What happens is that you have an intuitive perception of a truth in science, and then it's turned over to the left hemisphere people. And they work out all of the experiments that eventually proves that that original insight is true. Creativity is usually associated with that artistic right hemisphere of the brain. Any other questions? Now, the four different kinds of aesthetic, uh, uh, of uh, critical approaches to literature, which I had mentioned in the in the first uh, in the first lecture, <coughs> really be looked at really as two sets of right or left brain um, ways of looking even at literature. Now, the biographical approach to literature assumes that you've got to know about the author. You have to know what happened in his life. It assumes that the person who wrote whatever it is you're reading is the only person who could ever have written that the way that it was done. That it's an outgrowth of his individual set of experiences, his own individual um, ways of putting words together, the words that he's been exposed to, the ideas that he's been exposed to. The more, uh, from the biographical standpoint, the more that you know, excuse me, about the person, the more you'll be able to understand the work. It has an inherent drawback, by the way. You can see that that's a right hemisphere approach. It says the individual is important. It says that you have to be able to get inside the person to be able to get inside their work. Um, it's basically emotionally based. The reason that one person could only do that writing is because only his emotions went into it, and nobody else can have those exact same emotions. You have to be a little bit careful, though, of sliding over and using the other side of the brain when you use that approach and reasoning in reverse. In other words, if you're looking at a piece of literature, oh, uh, okay, let's say you're looking at a piece of, uh, you know that Edgar Allan Poe lost his, uh, lost his mother when he was two years old. It's legitimate to say that part of Poe's poetry, now Poe said that the most romantic subject, the most uh, proper subject for a poem is the death of a beautiful woman because that represents the loss of beauty from the world and so on. It's legitimate to say Poe probably got that idea because he lost his mother and he lost about four other women that he was in love with. Um, and that led him to it. It's not legitimate, though, to take a work 
from an author you know nothing about and try to make judgments about their life by reading their work. That kind of stuff was done in the late 30s. Uh, Sigmund Freud's daughter took Poe's work and said Poe really had an unresolved Oedipus complex. Um, he was afraid his father would desert him. He thought he was coming back and he, uh, because he had lost his mother that psychologically that made him different. You can't look at somebody's work and say, oh, this guy was really gay, but he was in the closet and wasn't mentioning it because he wrote in 1930, and that was something that was a scandalous, if not dangerous to your life thing to admit. However, you can take Walt Whitman, who we had, who we know is gay, was gay, and find places in his work where his being gay affected the way that he wrote the kind of poetry that he wrote. That is legitimate. So in other words, it's, it is okay to reason from the life to the work. It's not legitimate to reason from the work to the life. Uh, the second kind, the, the literary, is a left hemisphere way of approaching things. That says that there are, uh, all works come out of a, a, a tradition. Even if they go against the tradition that they're born in. Remember, writers are also readers. They read literature as they grow up. They make their own determinations about how good or bad that literature was. To the um, person who uses the literary approach, what a writer does is determined by what other writers have said about the purpose of literature. What ought literature to be? Again, should it, should it show people how they ought to be? Should it show people how they really are? Should it propagandize them to social uh, responses? Should it, should it do something to change the culture? Should it entertain people? Or should it enlighten people? All those are questions. How you answer that question develops a literary movement. The people who take the literary approach assume that a writer has to make, has to answer those questions one way or another. How he answers those questions determines how he writes. How he answers those questions is reflective of the literary movements that were current while he was born or that occurred before he was born, the ones that he was exposed to. And the way he writes them is related to how other people have written. That's, of course, a left hemisphere thing because it sets up a series of rules. We know this guy is a, is a naturalist because he does this, this, and this. We know this writer is a romantic because he does this, this, and this. We can approach the work by applying a set of rules and criteria. The third kind, the historical perspective, assumes that the real, uh, Im most important thing affecting a piece of literature is the time when it was written. Not really the person, but the times. For example, that the Civil War had a greater effect on what was being written than the events of Poe's life had on what he wrote. And they believe that everything emerges out of a time, out of a historical setting and that the historical setting determines what's good and bad and what can be written. And in fact, they have some uh, basis for that, what can be published. If you write uh, really flowery, sentimental poetry today, it's not going to survive. It's going to disappear because it'll never get published. And so it'll never get to another generation. So from the historical perspective, again, what gets done is really the effect of a series of rules imposed by the culture. 19th century, nobody <coughs> could have written, um, well, I'll take that back, erotic novels were written, but you would never have been able to publish them widely or to get famous for having written them in the 19th century because the times was sec were sexually repressive. They didn't allow that kind of literature. You couldn't have certain kind of endings. If you had, um, for example, Anybody in your novel who broke any of the laws in any major way, they had to be punished at the end, even if the laws were bad laws. Again, the historical perspective determines the work. That's a, another left brain approach. It says that we can figure out the various characteristics and apply them. The fourth way, the aesthetic approach, is another right hemisphere approach. It says the only thing that's important about a piece of literature is how it makes me feel the search for the beautiful. What happened to the author that caused them to write it doesn't mean anything. What happened in historically doesn't mean anything. And what literary historians and critics and English teachers say about it is all nonsense. What's important is, how does it work on me? Again, you can see how that emphasizes the emotional, the individual. And that assumes that a work of art, unlike the other versions, that assumes that a work of art is primarily an interaction 
that a work of art is not fixed in time. It's not even fixed by the intention of the author. Every, every piece of literature that's read is read differently by each individual and will be read differently by different generations of individuals. And what the book means is not what's in the book, but what comes out of the interaction between the reader and the work itself, which is often the reason why authors don't get to be famous or get a real following until after they're dead, because by then a different generation has, has grown up which is able to, to um, interact with that work in a different way than it, that the writer's contemporaries were able to interact. Yeah, but it's, at, it's the interaction that's at the basis. You can't have a great novelist unless you've got great novel readers. You can't have a great short story writer unless you've got great readers of short stories. And there have to be a lot of great readers of short stories. Anybody have any questions on the uh, critical approaches? They're basically the four that the, that, the course, that the course uses, and as we go through, we'll be doing each of these things that are mentioned from 16 um, on, classical, renaissance, and we'll be doing them the same kind of comparison and contrast that we've done with the right and left hemisphere. That, of course, is going to be the second half of the course. Um, next time we'll be doing, the next time this group meets in the small group, we will be discussing the right and left hemisphere a little more. And then the next, of course, lecture, as it says on the uh, on the schedule, is going to be uh, poetry. And that there's no reading for. I'll pass out the call.